introduce yourself. This Saving the Republic is one broadcast at a time. The Clark Cast with Matt Clark. Saving the Republic, one broadcast at a time. My name is Matt Clark. This right here is the show that unveils the insanity of today's politics every Saturday from 1 to 2 o'clock right here on WAAM, the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Also on FTR Radio, www.ftrradio.com. And since I'm in the mood to plug some websites, my own site, ClarkCast.com, you can obviously stream the show live, listen to archives, and all that other fun stuff. You know, I would, I would actually say there's a blog up there, which there is. Not updated it in a little bit. Shame on me. I would insert, you know, life is busy excuse right now. But there's a couple things I do want to plug when it comes to my blog. There's one thing I'm going to cite later on in the show, if we have time. Representative Hank Johnson, the guy who said, "Eh, you know, if we put too many troops on Guam, the damn thing might tip over and capsize. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that guy. He's actually one of my favorites. He, He really, really is. He offers great kindling for radio. Fantastic. Anyway, he says, uh, we don't have enough taxes yet because, you know, that whole free market stuff not really working out well. That's why we need government and government's not really efficient right now because we don't have enough taxes. And I mean, that makes sense, right? Anybody? Anybody? No. Also, if we have time, going to talk a little bit about some of the radical Islam, the Islamic stuff that's coming out from the mainstream media, which is baffling to me. You know, right after the Boston Marathon bomber got his death sentence, the prosecutor came out and said, you know... This really wasn't a political message. We don't want any sort of relation to Muslims out there. I mean, this was in a press conference talking about the death penalty, and all of a sudden we have to throw it. It's not Islam. No, no, no. We're good here. Stop. Don't look over. Really? And by the way, Bill Maher has some awesome, and I mean, I rarely, rarely agree with Bill Maher, but he actually has some pretty good stuff coming down on the line. But first thing I want to talk about, because I think it's so applicable, and it's an issue that we have, and it touches all of our lives, is the bias that's inside the mainstream media, and the news that came to light this past week around George Snuffleupagus from ABC is just, oh, mm, good pickings for uh, for a radio guy like me as well. I have to say, not surprised, but I think it's warranted. A conversation is needed. It's warranted. We must have it. We need to start talking about a lot of conflicts of interest that exist in the media, inside our own government. And I mean, yeah, the Clintons are right up at the front and center of this, not only with the Clinton Foundation, but a lot of the, uh, let's just say, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made a lot of things happen, whether it was for your best interest, mine, or maybe somebody else who decided to donate to the Clinton Foundation. Mm Mm-hmm. Going to start with that, but I have to bring somebody up to the microphone to help me out with all of the above here. You know him quite well. He's on the show quite often. Rich Hoffman, author of Tale of the Dragon, also OvermanWarrior.com. He also has a new book that's coming out in pieces, which I absolutely love. But I'm going to bring Rich up to the microphone right now from his own home studio. Rich, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm fantastic. And let's talk about the Snuffleupagus. (laughs) Snuffleupagus. Absolutely. By the way, you are coming in crystal clear. This is great. Before we do this, I I want to do a great announcement right here. So I'm getting married in uh, three weeks from today exactly. So I will probably not be, well, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to be on the air that day. I'll get in trouble if I am, but I'm going away for a couple weeks. Uh, Yeah, I know, Linda. It's crazy. (laughs) She's looking at me through the glass. What do you mean? Of course you can be on the radio. I'm going to go on a honeymoon as per tradition, and so I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks. And I've asked you to uh, grace Southeast Michigan with the great honor of having you guest host for a few weeks of the Clark cast. And you said, eh, I'll think about it. And we'll so, try not to burn down the state. Try not going. to burn it down, yeah. But anyway, so uh, you're sounding crystal clear. Glad to have you on board, and uh, welcome, sir. How are you? Well, it's great. It's a beautiful day. I love spring. I love May. Of course, I say that every time of year, but uh, I, I really love these these Saturday afternoons when you can get the the lawnmowers out and mow the grass on all of our nice private property. For now, it's private, Rich. For, For now, now yeah. right. Enjoy it while you still can. Oh, you'll still have to mow the lawn. It just won't be your lawn that you're mowing. Exactly. It'll be the, the people's lawn. The pe- <laughs> exactly, <laughs> comrade. You, you mow people's lawn right now. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we were going back and forth on what to talk about today because, it, as always, you know, you have an hour of radio and you get the whole week to choose from. And rarely is there a week where it's, eh, I'm stretching it for an hour because it's a light news week. And this actually has a, a lot of stuff this week. And the Snuffleupagus, George Snuffleupagus, I can't even <laughs> say his real name now. I think it's just, it's a bigger story than what, what it has even exposed so far. It's a massive story. And, you know, he, I mean, giving $25,000 a year to that foundation, which, you know, you know, my opinion on three it, years in a row too. 
Yeah, three years in a row. It's seventy five thousand dollars total. Um, that's not normal money. I mean, even if you're a person that has made six figures for a sustained period of time, that's a lot of money to give to a charity. Um, and even if you're a generous person, that's still a whole lot of money. And, and people forget that that Stephanopoulos, he was a um, he was a big time Clinton guy. I mean, he was the inspiration for the Michael J. Fox character. On um, Spin City, I think it was on TV, and and several other characters that uh, that have played in these these White House dramas. He set the bar at a different level with the the communications head for the White House and how they handle media. And then ABC gives him this gig where he's now a correspondent, but, and he does a great job because he's very good at communications. But here's this guy that is has a long history with the Clintons. He's given money to their foundation, which I. As far as I'm, I'm concerned, it's 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 just a big syndicate using uh, you know charitable foundations to laundering really money, con- laundering to, money, yeah, launder money yeah. and control people. You get access to very powerful people, so that when you need to shake somebody down, you can go to their boss and and uh, rattle the cage and get people fired or, or promoted, depending on 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 how. It's. And here's this guy giving money to this thing as a Clinton insider, and then he's interviewing people that are trying to poke at a presidential run of Hillary. And it's definitely a clash of interest. Oh, most definitely. Let's uh, let's go to the audio first, though. So here is George's apology. And then I want to take a step back and play something that he said before all of this really came to light, because I think this this adds a little bit more to the situation and it adds a little bit more gravity to the situation. So first, let me play his public apology on ABC. Uh, what was it Morning in America? I forget what the morning show that he hosts, but this is his apology right here. Over the last several years, I've made substantial donations to dozens of charities, including the Clinton Global Foundation. Those donations were a matter of public record, but I should have made additional disclosures on air when we covered the foundation. And I now believe that directing personal donations to that foundation was a mistake. Even though I made them strictly support work done to stop the spread of AIDS, help children, and protect the environment in poor countries, I should have gone the extra mile to avoid even the appearance of a conflict. I think that was a non-apology apology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt about that. But uh, that's, a, that's a communications expert. Oh, that's that right what that there. was. And as you said, the uh, Michael J. Fox character on Spin City was, uh, yeah. which was actually a decent show, some of sure. it. Uh, yeah, it was. It was, it was pretty, you learned a lot show. of things from it. Yeah, well, most definitely. Uh, you know, there's another thing. Uh, if he, have you seen House of Cards on Netflix at all? I, have, I haven't watched it yet. It's, I think it's a little too close to home for me, and I haven't taken the time to watch it. I'll tell you, I'm assuming you know the premise a little bit. It's about, oh, yeah. It's about the Southern congressman. Long story short, and I'm not really going to give away any uh, spoiler alert. Uh, he's just uh, the majority whip, and he makes his way up to be president of the United States without a single vote being cast for him. And his whole way of doing it is Washington inside, wheeling and dealing, uh, money exchanging hands, even death every now and then. And I'm thinking, and I was talking with some of my coworkers about a month ago, and I said, there's a takeaway mess. I mean, it's an awesome series, extremely well produced, awesome. I mean, it's fantastic. I really got into it. But I thought to myself throughout this whole series, this is real life. The only part of this that's fiction is just the characters and the specifics. Everything else is is a nonfiction story here. But going back to what you just said here, I mean, this is DC. You wash my hand or you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it's so interesting to see how this guy, aside from what you and I are talking about and the kind of, let's just say, spotlight we're putting on this, he's getting away with this. But I want to take a step back. Here's what he said not too long ago about those who donate to the Clinton Foundation and maybe some of the reasons why they may do it. You know, I read the book that this is based on Clinton Cash, read it, and I actually interviewed the author. Let me take a step back. He's talking about that book that revealed a lot of the different uh, Clinton scandals that recently came out. So talking about the Clinton Foundation and a lot of the scandals around the Clinton Foundation. So here it is again. You know, I read the book that this is based on Clinton Cash, read it, and I actually interviewed the author on Sunday. This is a tough one because when you actually look at, look closely at it, he even says there's no evidence of any direct action taken right. on behalf of the donors. But everybody also knows when those donors give that money and President Clinton or someone, they get a picture with him, right. that there's a hope to lead to something. Of and, and, and that's what you have to be careful of. That's what you have to be careful of. He's, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? That's, a, that's amazing. And, and him saying that on John Stewart's show, knowing exactly what he's guilty of, and him saying is he's totally detached. And just a few days later, you find out that he's a, a, a major donor. You know, one of the things I, I often ask myself is, does he, as he's saying that, and I think you may have just heard the big sigh that I, the sigh that I just had, as he's saying this, does he know 
that he's being hypocritical? Does he know? Or is it just whether it's Obama lying about Obamacare, he just repeats it over and over again, or somebody else lying about how great, uh, you know, another $100 million for green energy because this is going to work. Do they know they're lying about this stuff? Or have they been doing it so much, so often, for so long, it's almost like you don't even know you're lying anymore? Well, I think he's such a part of the Clinton machine, and, and he is. I mean, for over 20 years, he had a book that came out and was somewhat critical of the administration, you know, and maybe controlled bursts that everybody can agree on, you know, even the Clintons. But I think that they're such a part of the machine that they look at it as just the given the donations is, is necessary grease to keep the machine running. And I don't think they associate their actions to that grease. No, and see, this is the stuff that we know about. Look at how many different people, from, and this goes for both sides of the political aisle. Look how many people come out of an administration and then wind up on some sort of news organization or vice versa. And so I don't mind people having opinions. Obviously, you have your right to your own opinion if you want. But when you get placed in a position like George, who moderated a 2012 debate, who it was was going to moderate a 2016 debate without disclosing anything, how can any American know, hey, you know what, you're getting the real stuff here. You watch ABC, you watch this debate, you're going to get a nice clean right down the middle, no worries here. It's all a complete hoax. It is. And, and if you really look at the strategy, if you were to climb into the, the Clinton machine and study all the people who are involved, and what their overall goal is. And it's to, it's this is illicit money and to get everybody to, you know, it's, it's consensus building. I, I can't help but compare this to the, the small town politics that might occur, like, you know, you know some of the local school issues and the, the, the issues that occur with trustee runs in, in your local community. And you know that all those are about consensus building. You know, you pull in the chamber of commerce and you, you get the business leaders and anyone who might come out against whatever proposal you're trying to get, you, you get them together at a charity event. And you, you break bread with them. They may not agree with you 100 percent, but when you get into the, the trenches and have to fight it out, they'll tend to retreat rather than say bad things about you in the paper, which then gives you an open dialogue to say whatever you want and advance your position. And, and that happens a lot. And I think that this Clinton Foundation is just that on a massive scale. And it's, it brings in world leaders, big money, big business, all the media types, all into one umbrella gets everybody talking and, and breaking bread together. And then when it comes time to really have to cast an opinion, you can't because you're complicit with some of the behavior. And it's definitely a conflict of interest. And he shouldn't have been contributing. It's one thing to be charitable, but to give be charitable to such a political entity right. as, as his former employer, <laughs> he should know better. And then to be as arrogant to think that you can spin it because you're a communications guy and you can walk your way out of it because you played this nice cop such a long period of time. You think no one's has noticed a bad cop, and that is definitely, he's been caught. You got it. Matt Clark. You know, it's it's amazing, though, how many people will actually believe him and how this will be swept under the rug, and I hope it won't, not just for George Snuffleupagus, but, I mean, for the Clintons, too. And, and I would love an inside-out audit of the Clinton Foundation, especially if they want, and let's go back to the whole IRS stuff. You know, it's all about, uh, we can't have tea parties have 5013 See, you know, charitable uh, status, nonprofits that we can't have that. Uh huh. But yet the Clinton Foundation can. Money laundering is the phrase that we used before, so on and so forth. It's, it's just completely unbelievable. Joining me on the uh, phone, actually, joining me via Skype from Southern Ohio, Rich Hoffman, good friend, author of Tale of the Dragon, OvermenWarrior.com. If you want to be part of the program, 734 822 1600. 734 822 1600. Back in a few moments here. Saving the Republic, one broadcast at a time. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. The Clark Cast with Matt Clark. Call Matt now, 734 822 1600. Welcome back to the show that unveils the insanity of today's politics every Saturday from 1 to 2 o'clock. Right here on WAAM in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, Michigan. My name is Matt Clark. Joining me on the phone right now, actually via Skype, is Rich Hoffman, author of Tale of the Dragon, Overman Warrior, and also, Rich, you know, let's plug your, your new stuff right now, because I last show I waited to the very end, it cut you off, and, and so I want to give you a chance, an opportunity to talk about some of your work, and then I want to uh, close off some of the George Snuffleupagus stuff that we were talking about. So tell us the what's going on, because you have a very unique 
publishing approach right now where you're freely putting up each chapter individually uh, bit by yeah. bit. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a well, the work's a it's a cur- called a Curse of Force Seven Mile. It's sort of based on the the Johnson McCauley ways that they released the uh, the original Zorro stories, which ironically was called um, the, the Curse of Capistrano. And I was always a big fan of Macaulay's work and a lot of those old pulp writers because if you, if you go back and you look at how things were before the progressive age took over, the pulp writers were really kind of shaping, you know, they shaped the American Western. All the Westerns that came in the 20s, 30s, and 40s were basically shaped off old Mac- Johnston Macaulay writings. And I wanted to kind of bring some of that back. So if you're talking about restoring the Republic back to some of the, the ways that the, the values that we, we had before the, the, the Red Decade and all the different things that have come with all the, uh, the global communication, the television, and, and being able to communicate ideas freely. Uh, then there was a lot of, we talked about a lot of socialist and communist stuff that's been floating around out there. It's sort of whittled away at that classic American literature style. I wanted to go back to some of that that old-fashioned pulp style with uh, a new series, and, and no publisher would produce this in that fashion. So uh, since I have a pretty popular blog site that a lot of people seem to enjoy, I, I as a additional thing, the caveat to kind of give people something to look forward to each month. You mean OvermanWarrior.com? www.OvermanWarrior.com? Yep. Okay. That's the one. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so I put it out there to kind of give people something, a different format to, to sure. enjoy the same kind of work in an and not how things used to be, because I say they, I don't know, everything wasn't always so great. But as far as pulp fiction and the values that came out of some of the the Western musings that we used to have, uh, that was definitely. And it's a set in a, in a contemporary time. It's not an old West type thing, but it's definitely a contemporary take on the old classic Zorro type stories that led to all the great westerns that we all know and love. You know, and there's a lot of politics involved too so huh. i mean maybe to that's say the least to say the least maybe that's can't really say that's part of the contemporary phrase that you were using because politics is it stands the test of time the romans had politics you know the yeah. cavemen had politics everybody has pol- politics runs our life ruins our lives more often than not but you know it also puts into perspective a lot of stuff that's going on today with that zorro sense i've read the first few chapters so i, I can say that much right there but do you have a dedicated page on your site yet where it's just, because uh, I know you release these in blog post form with the download, but do you have a separate page where people can just click right over to and instantly get everything that you've posted so far? I have them on the sidebar on on each blog posting, whatever article that might come up any given day, because, you know, put a new, new one up every single day. Yeah, Some sure, days, sure. more than one. Um, so it, consistently on the sidebar are the different stories that we've put up so far. There's three, fourth one is getting ready to come up. Uh, should be by next weekend, um, and and it's just going to be a long running series that goes on as as we go. And each each chapter will end, end with a cliffhanger and and leads into the next segment. But uh, they're all available on the side. Uh, just click on the picture and it'll take you to it. Fantastic. OvermanWarrior.com. dot com. With uh, just a couple minutes here to the bottom of the hour, I want to round off the bias media section here. But if you still want to continue talking about it, by all means seven three four eight two two sixteen hundred seven three four eight two two one six zero zero. Geraldo Rivera recently came out in Fox News and said, you know, back in the year 1985, I was fired for making a $200 donation from ABC, the same news network that uh, George works for. I was fired. And here's what he had to say. I was fired by ABC News in 1985. The official reason given for my firing in 1985, of course, I had a very uh, contentious relationship with my boss, Ruin Arledge, at the time for other matters. But the official reason given for my being fired in 1985 was a $200 donation I made to a nonpartisan mayoral campaign in the town of New Bedford, Massachusetts, to a family friend. Okay, I'm just going to cut it off right there. $200, that's it. Now, he said there's that's probably the not the real reason why they let him go, but the one that they could actually legally say, here's why we're firing you. But, you know, there was a time when, and maybe this is just too naive of me to say, but when journalists were more journalistic, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but <laughs> there was some ethics. Uh, yeah, it's something like that. It's something like that. But, you know, we're now we're at a place here where it doesn't exist. You know, yeah. it, well, whatever. I work for Obama behind the scenes. I do this ABC gig during my as my day job. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Stefan Loftus would say it's inflation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we would look over to the progressives and blame them for that, George. 
<laughs> it's not my fault. No, so, it was no else. absolutely not. It seven was three. <laughs> said it was George Bush. Seven three four eight two two sixteen hundred. Seven three four eight two two one six zero zero is the phone number if you want to be on the Clark Cast. Coming up after the bottom of the hour here, I want to do a little discussion about Islam. What happened with the Boston Marathon bomber trial? And a little, little few other things. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. One broadcast at a time. The Clark Cast with Matt Clark. 734-822-1600 is the phone number if you want to be on the Clark Cast. 734-822-1600. Let's transition a little bit. If you're just now joining us, I was talking about George Stephanopoulos. See, I can do it. I got it right in the very first part of the show. My buddy Rich Hoffman down in Ohio is joining me via Skype from his newly constructed home studio. And he's obviously a wealth of information, really great feedback, and a really great comment. And I wanted to switch gears a little bit, Rich, and talk about the Boston bomber and what happened after and really what's going to happen next. And I'm pro-death penalty if it warrants the death penalty. My only issue with the death penalty is it takes forever and it usually costs more money. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they they they, he's going to be on death row for a long time. Yep. But something struck me as really bad, so uh, really strange, and maybe not strange. I should not really, nothing should surprise me anymore. Nothing really should. I, I'm not saying I'm immune <laughs> to everything, but some of the craziest stuff comes out of the woodwork these days. But right after the the decision happened, uh, it was either the state prosecutor or one of the local prosecutors, anyway, one of the government representatives, if you will, came out and said this. And this bugged me a little bit because in this time when, hey, America or Boston specifically, look, this guy who was a terrorist, he was a terrorist, is a terrorist. Yeah, he got the death penalty. He got what's coming to him. But we still had to add a little bit of a political message into this. Take a listen. The defendant claimed to be acting on behalf of all Muslims. This was not a religious crime. And it certainly does not reflect true Muslim beliefs. It was a political crime designed to intimidate and to coerce the United States. Is that really the most appropriate place to put this in a press no, conference? I, <laughs> she she really she's way overstepping her bounds on something like that. And you just you just declare the death penalty for somebody that terrorized a major American city. You have to identify it for what it correctly is. And you don't want to go lacerate all Muslims or people who, of any faith. You know, but when you have uh, people like that Abdu al-Baghdadi guy. Um, who's head of ISIS, who's broadcasting that Muslim is a, or Islam is a religion of fighting. Mm-hmm. It's very appealing to young men uh, like this kid um, who are looking for a direction, looking to, to make their way in the world and prove that they're brave and, you know, whatever primal emotion is, is raging through young guys out there. They're, they're attracted to that kind of stuff. So when she says things like that, she's not a, properly identifying the real problem and there's there's thousands of others just like him out there looking to see how we deal with that as a society. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, right on the heels of the Draw Muhammad contest. And I'm so surprised how many people came out in the mainstream media and said, look, we can't draw Muhammad. I mean, you offended somebody, so I'm not going to say you got what you deserve because that would be crossing the line. But you got what you deserve. I mean, it's they almost went that far. Yeah, they did. They, they did almost go that far. And. You know, uh, South Park pushed it a, a few years ago, well, about a decade ago, when they yeah. did the same type of thing, and, and they saw some ridicule, and they're, they're hardly conservatives like Pam Geller, but you can't allow yourself, to, when you have a, a reli- if religion is advanced based on its intimidation method, and this goes back to the whole Clinton Foundation thing, when you have any organization, whether it be a religion or a political entity, that is, is set up as, a, if I'm going to thump your head if you don't join me, then you have a problem. You If, you, if you're mode is of advancing your cause is through some sort of terrorism, whether it's fear induction, then you're on the wrong side of something. Bill Maher came out, and it, it, Bill Maher is very, very interesting in my opinion or in my book. You know, most of the time he's a complete nut job, 
I mean, really far out there. But when it comes to radical Islam, and he bashes all religion, and he's pretty consistent in that, but when it comes to Islam, he's almost defended Christianity over Islam just because of how far Islam goes when it comes to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, so on and so forth, and even some of the the mess inside of our own government when it comes to the political correctness. I mean, he's really solid on that. So he was he's very critical of what he calls liberals, let's just say the left in general, of how they'll treat, how they'll classify victims in certain ways and how they deal with religion. And I'm being vague because I want the audio to speak for itself. So here it is. Why is it that so many liberals, I mean, liberals who absolutely hate blaming the victim, when it, as they should, as we all should, when it comes to rape cases and so forth, how dare you blame the victim? So many blame you <laughs> they turn the finger on you you're the bad guy M- meaning those that criticize islam and, and of that nature now here's the second follow-up clip right here i mean when i see a woman in the head-to-toe burqa what i call it the beekeeper suit <laughs> uh, i see someone who is oppressed because i don't think anyone really wants to live that way especially in the hot sun uh, but I've heard many liberals say, well, that's, the, that's their custom, that's their, that's their uh, culture, that they want it like that, they like it. And I say, they like it? That's what pimps say. <laughs> yeah. That's what pimps say. It is. Yeah. They like it. Yeah. And you know... They b- guys in an alley and give me the money. They like it. Uh, maybe, As you know, all right, too far. And maybe I should not have played that last part right there, but I mean, there's a point to that. It and, does get the point. And when you really start talking about feminism in America 2015, and it's not even a burn your bra kind of feminism, it's the war against women, you're taking away my birth control, Mitt Romney kind of feminism. It's right. always, always omitted from the conversation how women are treated under Sharia law in all parts of the Middle East. It's insanity that they don't even bring this distinction together. You have the same side arguing two different sides of the same argument. I mean, Obama was criticized for talking down to Elizabeth Warren. Just, I mean, I didn't think he said anything all that negative, but they came out and and land blasted him for talking down to the little woman. And then to defend this whole Islamic mess with, if you even bring up that it's it's a religious crime, then you're somehow a demon. It's crazy. Ken's been patiently waiting by on the phone line, 734-822-1600. 734-822-1600 if you want to be part of the conversation. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I had to call in because uh, one thing that is important to me is the use of proper words, proper terminology. And when we're proper talking nouns, about our grammar. Islamic threat, the one phrase I constantly hear that's just not correct, and I wish people would start uh, doing their homework and uh, start looking the facts behind this. In other words, what I said. Yes. Okay. The term, well, Ken, 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 Ken. We've known, we known each other for Islam. so long, you can just cut me right to the quick. I mean, come on. Well, here's the thing. Now, I've not only read cover to cover the Quran itself, I've examined the history from Muhammad to now, the 1400 years, and we have to accept the truth. The truth is that the proper terminology should be devout Muslims. When we're looking at what happened to Boston, we're talking about ISIS, when we talk about Hezbollah and and, uh, other Islamic groups, we should be using the correct terminology. These are devout Muslims. These are people who believe in exactly what Muhammad taught. These are people who are following, as it's written, the Quran. These aren't a small group of radicals. These are true, devout followers of Islam. And it's doing a disservice to constantly trying to use the term radical Islam, trying to say, oh, all Muslims aren't bad. We have to look at their source material. We have to look at the Quran. We have to look at the other writings of Islam. And we'll base this not on individuals. We'll base this on their teaching. Well, can I get your point? I I do. I mean, in the United States, um, most Muslims are good. Across the world, which are the majority of of Muslims, they're Sharia law. I mean, they're bound by Sharia law. By the way, do you know of the Imam Chowdhury, Anjum Chowdhury? Have you heard of him? I haven't heard of him. Uh, okay, well, but, uh, the, I am quite familiar with uh, what they're doing around the world. Here's here's why I bring this guy up. Rich, do you know of him? No, I, I can't say I recall. Okay, but here's why I bring this guy up. He's on Fox News all the time. He's on other news outlets oh, all the time. Oh, I do know who you're talking about. And he is very vocal, I mean, to his credit, and I kind of cringe when I say that, about what he wants, what Sharia law truly is. He lives in the UK. He has a, a flock or whatever they call it. He, he's part of a, a mosque over there. He's an imam. And he's very vocal about 
not only that he wants Sharia law across the land in every part of the world, uh, he also wants capital punishment for those that convert from Islam to whatever. He wants capital punishment for homosexuals, but he does put the caveat if they're caught and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you'll see him on uh, Sean Hannity's show, for example. You'll see him on, I think even our own Stephen Crowder here had him on his radio show. And he'll say, you know, yeah, if you draw the Prophet Muhammad, I want you dead. But hey, we we're, we can all live in peace. Now, that's the guy that was on that had was um he was on with Sean Hannity when he, he had Pam Geller on. Yes. After that, yes, yes, after yes. that attack. Yep. Okay, I know who you're talking about. Let's see if I can't find some of him. I I first came across this guy, and like I said, to his credit, he's very vocal and he's very specific and he's honest. Hey, the, yeah, yeah. I, I want you dead if you do X, Y, and Z. I want, in fact. You know, under Sharia law, Christians can exist, quote unquote, with air quotes, but you have to pay a price. You have to pay a fine. And there are certain restrictions. So, you know, you can be a Christian, but you're going to live in oppression. He's he's the Bernie Sanders of their movement. Unbelievable. <laughs> see if I can't find Bernie Sanders of their movement. By the way, is he running for president? Yeah, yeah. he's running for president. So I'm a so he's a socialist, wants to bring uh, Swedish socialism to the United States. Sweet, Goodness Swedish. So, oh, okay, here, I do have it. We do believe as Muslims, the East and the West will one day be governed by the Sharia. Indeed, we believe that one day the flag of Islam will fly over the White House. Indeed, there's even a narration of the Prophet where he said, the day of judgment will not come until a group of my ummah conquer the White House. Now, I gotta be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed in my audio vault here, because that's the more benign thing that he has said in, in, recent, in recent history here. As you just mentioned with Pam Geller, I mean, he's flat out calling for a, a fatwa on her, uh, killing her on the air yeah. and calling for death. I mean, it just and so I, mean, I that's you can't said, even deal with that kind of person. Exactly. So that said, let me round this out a little bit more. I want to replay what the Boston prosecutor said at the conclusion of the uh, the Boston bomber uh, sentence, the death sentence. She said this. The defendant claimed to be acting on behalf of all Muslims. This was not a religious crime. And it certainly does not reflect true Muslim beliefs. No, it's not a religious crime. And in their mind, it's uh, he's going to heaven. 72 virgins. There you go. Islam is a religion. And he just repeated exactly what that al-Baghdadi guy said. Puts it in a classification of religious crime. Unbelievable. You know, I want to go to break right now, Rich, because I do want to come back and talk a little bit about taxes, which is everybody's. Oh, oh, my gosh. This is absolutely fantastic. I don't you, have any opinion about taxes. No, no. Rich Hoffman, opinion about taxes? Hell no. I, I think not. No. By the way, uh, did I mention his blog is uh, overmanwarrior.com where it's dominated by that kind of stuff? Matt it, Clark. I like it, though. I mean, it's it's good, solid material that I think most people should read. Do you want to be part of the program? 734-822-1600. 734-822-1600. The reason why I bring up taxes, it's not taxes itself. It's the mindset, the mentality around the idea of big government versus small government, liberty versus freedom, or liberty and freedom versus tyranny. And really, the idea that government's there to take care of you, you know, folks, we need to become more self-sustaining. And the idea that government's here to take care of everybody needs to be, well, this is an educational campaign. And that educational campaign will continue in just a few moments here. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. Cast with Matt Clark. Call Matt now, 734-822-1600. Representative Hank Johnson is arguably one of my favorite congressmen of all time. And yes, there is just a little bit of an ounce of sarcasm woven into that statement right there. He's one of those guys where I don't want to insult the man's intelligence, and I have to say, because the man is African American, this is not a racial statement that I'm about to say, but he's really not the brightest bulb on the tree sharpest knife in the drawer, or some other metaphor similar to that that insults his intelligence, but actually it's his own intelligence that does the insulting. Recently he came out and said, you know, we really need more taxes in America. A lot of the issues that we have is this whole free market capitalism versus government. And really, if we just have more taxes coming down the line, if we just have a little bit more of those evil rich pay their fair share, eh, we'll be okay. Now, Rich, I know you completely agree with that statement, and that's quite often uh, your point on your blog is we just need less freedom. Welcome to back. To say the least. To say the least, exactly. So <laughs> I, I want to play some of this, and really just to set the stage and give folks just a little bit of a background, and I often get in trouble for replaying this, 
This is Hank Johnson, in case you forgot. My, my fear is that uh, the whole island will uh, become so overly populated that it will tip over and, uh, and capsize. Yeah, talking about Guam and putting more troops on Guam. And I, he's just looking out for the troops, Rich. Just looking out for the troops kind of guy he you got, is. You got to watch those floating islands. They <laughs> do tip over if you stay on on one side too much. I hate those. You know, you go on vacation, you go on one of these floating islands, and you're like, damn, now the <laughs> flight back home is twice as long. What about Hawaii? Well. Or Hawaii. You got to watch those big waves. They the, kind of knock it around a whole lot. That's only because of global warming, though. I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so he was on a radio show, and uh, I, I want to play this exchange back and forth. It's about a minute long. I want to cut off the clip about a couple seconds in, because I don't have the whole clip, but I think this is very important, the very beginning part. Take a listen. You said... The debate right now is between the free marketers and those who believe in an involved government. Okay, I'm going to stop it here. The host said, you said, meaning Hank Johnson, the debate lies between the free marketers and those that want more government. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that we have that foundation set, let me replay that. You said the debate right now is between the free marketers and those who believe in an involved government. But doesn't an involved government even, though, have to live within its means? And isn't that exactly what one of your neighbors, House Budget Committee Chair Tom Price from Cobb County, is saying? That we have to, at some point, make these cuts or we'll face a much more dire financial situation later on. Well, for those who protect their corporate friends from having to pay taxes, mm. that rings very hollow. Mm. Uh, if everyone is paying their fair share of taxes, then we certainly should and can live within our means. But our problem now is that taxes are being paid by the middle class. The rich, the wealthy, and the corporations are not paying their fair share. And so, therefore, we don't have enough to do what the, the government uh, and do what the country needs the government to do. And uh, that's the problem. Mm, that's the problem. So I wrote down the key phrases, fair share, corporate friends, middle class, and don't have enough. And you're supposed to trust a guy that thinks that Guam's going to tip over to be the managing <laughs> party of who, who decides what fair share is. Right, right. So, by the way, and, and this is so great, especially when you're on a one-on-one -on -one debate with somebody who says, the rich don't pay their fair share. This is coming right out of the CBO, Congressional Budget Office. That's your manager. That's who manages That's all the, man, the money yeah. that we send there. Uh huh. So the top 1%, the evil, and I mean evil, evil richest 1% of all of America. And, and Rich, when I say evil, I mean this kind of evil. <laughs> that kind of evil yeah. rich, the evil 1%, they pay almost 40%, 40% of all federal income taxes. Yeah, without that 1%, that guy don't have a job. He doesn't have anything even, even he didn't have a desk to sit at. Well, well, hold on, it gets better. So, again, CBO, top 10% of all income earners, you know, you got to factor in those that actually make money. Top evil 10%. Now, not quite that evil music from before, maybe more of a... <laughs> this, this is your top 10% right here. Right, right. They pay 71% of all federal income taxes. And 71. That puts, that puts a square now? 90-some percent? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's, it's top 10 includes the top one. So, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. And, and here's another statistic right here. Almost 50% of Americans don't pay income tax at all. So Which if is we're, true. If we're going to talk about fairness, I really don't think the argument holds up there, Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson. No, it doesn't at all. And, you know, he's uh, a pe we kind of look at him. People have been accustomed to look at politicians like that as the managing party, but you know, they're representatives. This is a republic. We hire, we, we elect those people to represent us as, as benefactors of our interests. But he's a, he's a government employee, just like any employee. And every employee, I don't care what they're doing, I don't care if they're mowing grass or they're running companies, everybody thinks they're worth more money than they really are. The marketplace determines what your real value is. And somebody has to decide who manages that. And that's what the people who tend to be the, the largest task contributors. That's their job. Oh, exactly. And but, he clearly doesn't get it. But from a political standpoint, it has nothing to do with I, I agree with what you said. You know, I go back and I have the audio. We don't have enough time because we only have about a minute and a half right now. But in 2008, Obama 
during a debate against Hillary Clinton, he was asked by the moderator, you know, when Bill Clinton actually lowered the cap gains tax, the capital gains tax from you know, 28 percent to 15 or whatever, the government saw an increase, an increase in revenue. So why are you going to raise it again? And Obama's response wasn't, well, I disagree with that. That was not his response. His response was, well, I would increase it for, quote, purposes of fairness, end quote. So it has nothing to do with the lack of money or trying to get more money. It has everything to do with punishing those who are more successful. All right. It's a determination of fairness defined by one political party that does not represent the majority yeah. of the rest. Something we did not get to, and I'm kicking myself for this. There was a guy over in the UK who was pushing, you know, those children who have bedtime stories read to them at night, they have an unfair advantage because actually their brain develops a little bit more of that. Uh, than those that don't, those children that don't get read bedtime stories. So maybe we should just not read bedtime stories so everybody's on the same playing field. I mean, well, if you don't read your kids' bedtime stories, they become like Representative Johnson. <laughs> the whole island will tip over. And exactly. Rich Hoffman, thanks for joining me. His website is overmenwarrior.com, author of a myriad of different things. Make sure you check out his website and so much more. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week. Take care. For show highlights and more, visit www.clarkcast.com. <laughs>